The end is nigh. The end of 1984, that is. It's NES Works Guide in episode 21. I'll be back. As we hit November 1984 this episode, you'll notice the Famicom's release schedule has begun to accelerate. Once we hit 1985, third parties will begin to arrive in droves, and the Famicom's annual release list of about 20 games will become something more like 200 games a year. The Famicom boom is almost here, but for now, let's enjoy the relative call, with just eight more games for the year from Namco and Nintendo. Another Mahjong title? That's right, just as Sega did with Home Mahjong, Nintendo is attempting to put right its greatest failing of the first year of Famicom software releases, publishing a half-baked Mahjong game. Now, this is still a single-player title, unlike Home Mahjong. In hindsight, I'm honestly a little surprised Nintendo hadn't been the ones to come up with the idea of a foldable screen divider in order to create a privacy shield for a multiplayer Mahjong experience, given that the company had far more grounding in producing toys and gadgets than video games. Just look at how many throwaway peripherals and doodads they've released through the years for their video games. Wii Remote add-ons probably account for something like 15% of all human landfill waste between 2006 and 2015. But at this point, Nintendo hadn't quite reached the peak of their powers, and the Famicom's performance hadn't yet given them cause to be arrogant enough to fill their customers' homes with largely useless plastic. So instead we get this, a game lacking the add-on edge of its direct competition from Sega. As with Family Basic, this Mahjong adaptation comes to us from Hudson, despite having been published under the Nintendo banner. Again, it's easy to see why Hudson ended up arriving as the first developer to step out as an independent third party for Famicom. They had a close and, one assumes, trusting relationship with Nintendo. So hailing from a studio that had a firm handle on both the Famicom hardware and the Nintendo house style, Yonin Uchi Mahjong fits right in here with other Nintendo releases. And it looks and sounds a bit nicer than Ho Mahjong for SG-1000, though the simplicity of Mahjong does make it a sort of 8-bit equalizer. The usual Mahjong routine applies here, but instead of playing Ricci against one virtual opponent, you play against three. And that, as they say, is that. And we have another second-party title arriving hot on the heels of Yonni Uchi Mahjong, F1 Race, developed by HAL Labs and published by Nintendo. Now, we've already taken a pretty good look at this game back on Game Boy Works with the launch of its portable successor, F1 Race. Unsurprisingly, F1 Race looks a heck of a lot more impressive than Yonin Uchi Mahjong, or, for that matter, just about anything else that's appeared on Famicom to this point. As with Golf and Pinball, tech wizard Satoru Iwata programmed this racer, and he managed to coax performance out of the Famicom hardware that had never before been seen. In this case, we have a behind-the-camera viewpoint for a Formula One racer that cruises at high speeds down a twisting roadway that scrolls smoothly. While the nature of F1 racing in general means this is a more limited game than comparable experiences on SG-1000, such as Zippy Race and Safari Race, the speed and grace with which F1 race unfurls really sets a high bar for home consoles. The most direct point of comparison for F1 race would really be Namco's arcade hit pole position. HAL Labs conspicuously lifted the formula and style of that game here, and since Namco never released Pole Position on Famicom or NES, this gave fans a convincing ersatz rendition of the coin-op favorite. Then again, maybe Namco didn't publish Pole Position on Famicom because F1 Race turned out so well. After all, it wouldn't do to be shown up by a competitor with the format you had perfected. Had history turned out a little differently, which is to say, had Atari shipped the 7800 console in 1984 as intended, F1 Race would have existed in parallel, albeit on the other side of the planet, with that console's pack-in conversion of Pole Position 2. F1 Race gives a better showing on the tech side of things, but Pole Position 2's accurate renditions of four popular Japanese racetracks gives it a little bit more structure and variety. In any case, the benefit of hindsight really demonstrates the blossoming nature of the post-crash console wars in Japan and America. Famicom handily outclassed the SG-1000, while Atari's new system offered an impressive contender. Uh, but how things would change. By the time the Famicom's NES incarnation reached nationwide distribution in the US and began to storm Europe, the 7800 had been mired in Atari's corporate disruptions and had only begun to appear at retail with software that felt a few years out of date. Meanwhile, the SG-1000 had mutated into the Mark III, or Master System, 
and offered visual output that exceeded Nintendo's offerings. As for F1 Race, well, it's fine if limited. Nintendo explored the idea of publishing it for NES under the name Nintendo 500. It appears in coming soon lists and several 1985-86 issues of the Computer Entertainment Newsletter, but they evidently decided against it. Instead, we got Mach Racer, which seemingly repurposed F1's scrolling routines in favor of futuristic motorcycle adventures that combined the final stretch sequences of Zippy Race with the road combat of Spy Hunter. I'd say it was the right choice. And over on the Namco side of things, the follow-up to Galaxian for Famicom continues the company's chronological journey through its own greatest arcade hits, with a home conversion of its biggest hit ever, the smash success Pac-Man. Now, as with Galaxian, the world was not exactly hurting for home conversions of Pac-Man by 1984, but once they got a look at what Namco had to offer here, even the naysayers had to clam up. This Pac-Man is pretty close to being an arcade-perfect home conversion. I say pretty close because, once again, the source material for this cartridge ran on a vertically-oriented monitor, which meant proportions and scaling needed to be adjusted for home televisions. The funny thing is that there hadn't really been many official Pac conversions in Japan to this point. While American and European consumers were more or less drowning in home adaptations of wildly varying quality and accuracy, Namco had barely tapped their domestic market. From what I can tell, official ports of Pac-Man appeared in 1983 on the Sharp X1 and NEC PC8801 home computers, both of which were vastly more expensive and had drastically smaller user bases than contemporary consoles. An MSX version appears to have been published exclusively in Europe by a company called Bugbyte, but that one doesn't look to have made its way to Japan. And finally, there was the infamously flawed Atari 2600 conversion, which showed up alongside that system's Japanese release as the Atari 2800 in 1983. But few Japanese consumers bought into that particular platform, so they were spared the indignity. The point is, this immaculate rendition of Pac-Man was the first home console rendition of the game to have made its way to a mass market platform in Japan. Sure, it was a little late in arriving, but the circumstances of its release meant it sold extraordinarily well. And you kind of have to envy Pac-Mans in Japan. They had to wait a long time for a proper console port, but it was so much better than anything that had been rushed to market in the US a year or two earlier. Since I've already said plenty about this game on both NES Works and Game Boy Works, there's no need to once again belabor the point. Suffice it to say, Namco established itself as a premier presence on Famicom, did a lot of good public relations for the console, a pattern that would continue a week later with the release of Namcot's next Famicom cart. Now this is more like it. With its third home release, Namco jumped a little bit out of chronological order by leapfrogging Galaga all the way over to Xevious, a very recent arcade smash hit that had yet to see a home release by the end of 1984. While Atari Soft had licensed the game for home release on Atari 2600 and 5200, those versions appear to have been subsumed by the Atari crash of 1982 and 83. So far as I can tell, Xevious for Famicom heralded the arcade hit's home debut in all regions. While a less exacting conversion than Galaxian or Pac-Man, it was after all a later and more sophisticated creation in its coin-op incarnation, it played here with admirable fidelity. And more to the point, it arrived while the original still had some heat among Japanese audiences. As I've mentioned time and again, Xevious had a huge impact on Japanese shooter design in the mid-80s. I've honestly lost count of all the games whose design was so clearly inspired by Namco's shooter. And I have to believe that much of the disparity in popularity between Xevious in the US and Japan can be traced back to this home adaptation. Sure, the game was and is fairly well liked in the West, but across the Pacific, it's something of a video gaming touchstone. Its soundtrack made its way into pop music, It influenced games like Star Jacker, Star Soldier, Twin Bee, and Exit X's. It often ends up being included in compilations or even fully remade, as in the 3D Classics port for Nintendo 3DS. Xevious was a big deal, and the fact that it appeared on Famicom as the best shooter by far at a time when the console had begun to explode into the mainstream of pop culture surely helped bolster its popularity. But what exactly made Xevious so unique and so groundbreaking? Simply put, it took the shooter genre to the next stage of its evolution from Galaga. 
I went over this a few years ago, but that's somewhere deep in the recesses of this video channel at this point, so just to reiterate. The shooter burst into popularity, especially in Japan, where the format found its most enthusiastic audience with the launch of Taito's Space Invaders, 1978. In a sense, you could see Space Invaders as an evolution of Atari's breakout, replacing the paddle and ball with a tank and gun, and substituting a host of advancing aliens for the brick wall at the top of the screen. Where Breakout presented players with a single element of danger, the ball, which could corrom off the bricks and slip past the player's defense, Space Invaders presented two. Not only did the invaders drop missiles at the player's tank, but the alien fleet also marched inexorably downward, creating a harsh time limit in which to destroy them all. Galaxian, which we saw last episode, turned the invaders' threat into a more dynamic sort of danger, with players constantly on their toes to avoid dive bombing attacks and aggressive head-on collision attempts. Galaga, which we've seen a few times already, took the Galaxian concept even further, with more elaborate enemy formations, a brilliant risk-reward mechanic, and the suggestion of flying forward through space with its scrolling starfield backdrops. Xevious takes all of those elements and amplifies them. The hint of implicit motion in Galaga becomes substance here, as the entire game takes place in a terrestrial setting where varied land formations constantly scroll past beneath the player. The ground that streaks past beneath your Solvalu fighter craft here is not some superficial visual gimmick. The surface factors into combat as an integral part of Xevious' identity. While you continue to do battle with waves of enemy aircraft which have abandoned their stayed formations in favor of swooping into the fray a handful at a time, you also have to be mindful of land-based threats. These scroll past more slowly than the airborne fighters, sometimes fixed to a stationary spot on the ground, and sometimes shifting around on wheels or treads. Either way, they love to take pot shots at you. Their tiny projectiles can come as a real surprise when you're focused in on your speedier, more aggressive aerial foes, especially when they're fired from what appears to be a harmless bit of scenery that suddenly emits a bullet in your direction without warning. However, your Solvalo is hardly helpless against either type of enemy. Your fighter can fire off all range, air-to-air -air attacks, as well as launch air-to-ground bombs. A reticle that tracks a dozen lengths ahead of the Solvalo or rather half a dozen links in the Famicom version, which once again finds itself compacted along its vertical axis to accommodate the shift to a horizontal screen orientation. It doubles as both aerial crosshairs and a precision targeting finder for your bombs. Xevious hits you with a variety of threats and it constantly mixes up the nature of the dangers you face, making for a game that can't be completed through pattern memorization alone. The most basic enemy fighters you face are so toothless that they dodge out of the way the moment they cross your line of fire. But other ships take a more aggressive approach, relying on dazzling attack patterns or even invincibility to keep you on your toes. And then of course there are the Andor Genesis bosses, which fill the screen with both their bulk and their scattershot homing projectiles that materialize from thin air before streaking after the Sovalu. And just to make things that much more white-knuckled, Andor Genesis can only be destroyed with an air-to-ground bomb, even though it looks like a flying enemy. On top of that, even the standard throngs of enemies love to do a number on you. The longer you advance on a single life, the trickier the action becomes. The enemy fleet adjusts to your skill level by sending stronger and more aggressive waves of attackers after you the longer you manage to stay alive. Dying, or taking out certain radar towers, helps lower the enemy threat level, causing meager ships to spawn and fire less frequently. But of course, the point of the game is to get as far as possible in the number of lives you're given, which means that racking up high scores involves weaving nimbly through curtains of bullets and increasingly erratic enemies. Add up these individual components and you get Xevious, a shooter that raised the bar for complexity in the genre over everything that had come before. And the Famicom port of the game, handled internally by Namco, turned out incredibly well despite the unavoidable compromises that had to be made to account for the differences in arcade and home tech. In arcade, Xevious wasn't simply a vertically oriented game, it was a visual treat. Players had to deal with dozens of different enemy types, some of which could only be seen by truly skillful players, but all of which make use of a consistent red on metallic gray color scheme, with careful shading that makes everything look very nearly computer rendered. The Famicom wasn't quite up to the task in these early days of recreating that look, but even so, this almost definitely seems like the best looking shooter to have appeared on the console by the end of 1984. So yes, Xevious made a huge splash in Japanese arcades, and its impact was sustained by the success and the quality of its Famicom conversion. Sadly, Americans wouldn't see this conversion until 1988, and Europeans until 1989, so the wow factor had more or less faded by that point. That doesn't make Xevious any less notable or any less playable. It just means that those of us outside of Japan missed out. 
but wasn't that usually the case when it came to Famicom and NES? Next on NES Works Guide In, well, we'll get to 1985's unrelenting firehose torrent of Famicom releases in due time as we continue the road to NES Works. But first, there's a little bit of side business to take care of. 